Okay, everyone. I must warn you. If you are easily scared by phantoms, or if you're offended by dark stories, now is the time for you to stop and exit this tour of Manor House. Otherwise, you enter at your own risk. Discretion is advised. This presentation is produced by Manor House Productions. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like our video and leave a comment while you're there. Visit ManorHouseShow.com and sign up for the RIP section where you'll receive Manor House exclusives not found here or anywhere else. Your plot is waiting. And if you make it out alive after tonight's tale, you will have the option of renting a room for the night here at Manor House. It will be an experience you'll never forget. Tonight's tale is St. Michael's Wood by B.T. Joy. B.T. Joy is a British horror writer whose short fiction has appeared within the printed pages, internet presences, and podcasts of markets such as Static Movement, Surreal Grotesque, James Ward Kirk Fiction, Human Echoes, Micro Horror, Flashes in the Dark, SQ Magazine, Forgotten Tomb Press, and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, among others. He is also a practicing poet, and his poetry can be found in magazines and anthologies produced worldwide. He is currently working as a high school English teacher in Heilongjiang, China. He can be reached through his website, btj0005uk.wix.com slash btjoypoet to read BT Joy's exclusive interview on our website as well as the rest of our exclusive author interviews, visit manorhouseshow.com. Follow me. The Phantom Collector awaits. Welcome. Come in. Don't be scared. At least... Not yet. Hear that? A guest didn't like it when I sent the bellhop's resurrected corpse up to their room. So now they're playing monastery chants to drive demons and evil spirits out. Somebody should tell them, try again. That's the wrong music. I think it's kind of soothing, don't you? But there's nothing soothing about tonight's spooky saga. One man wants to die. Another man wants to live. And it isn't until they cross each other's paths, and that of a ghostly woodsman, that they find out life and death aren't much different from each other. Gather round. Look into the light. Look. Look deep. Open your imagination and listen to the story called Saint Michael's Wood.
The cave was tucked away within the sound of the Dnieper, in among a stand of black oak so minor that it showed on no regional maps, but that the people of nearby Kniv referred to as St. Michael's Wood. It was night. The stars were out like a bridal queue above the dark trees, and Yevgeny Voitenko was already kneeling down, quite alone, in that tiny hermitage of rock at the heart of the forest. The natural alcove by which he knelt contained the only two possessions he hadn't yet disavowed. The small whale oil lamp, which lit only whatever corner of the cell it happened to be in, while nevertheless making the whole place smell of fish fat burning on a stove, and carved from ebony the simple image of the Redeemer on the cross to which he prayed. As was his custom, he'd started some hours ago with the Jesus prayer, asking only for mercy in the usual way, and now he would continue to recite under his breath the prayer for enemies until exhaustion finally overtook him and he was compelled to sleep, at which point he would lay out no bedclothes and would remove all garments save the hair shirt, and he'd climb on the few small maple boards he'd arranged at the head of the cave in the general shape of a pauper's coffin. Once inside there, he would try to find sleep without thinking at all, and, if he did think, it would only be to ask the one small indulgence he dared solicit for himself, that for him the morning shouldn't come, and that instead he should be called home to Christ in the night. Voitenko had been finishing one cycle of prayer, and his head was beginning to grow sluggish with approaching fatigue. He elected, quite unconsciously, to finish that last incantation before taking himself to his boards, and he had just been mouthing the last words. Help us to remain safe from the temptations of the devil and from all the perils which threaten us in the form of visible and invisible enemies. When, at that exact moment, there was such an obstreperous clash on the forest litter outside that Voitenko's heart nearly turned over in his chest, and the old man cast his eyes fretfully to the mouth of the cave. The noises continued out on the tree-covered undergrowth, and Voitenko was sure it was the sound of a decent-sized man hallooing and rolling around on the earth, crawling, it seemed, in the general direction of the sheltered heritage. With the night full on, and it not yet being spring entirely, Voitenko had no idea what to expect upon emerging from the cave to face the disturbance. At most, he had banked on encountering a drunk from Kniv, and so his surprise was redoubled at the sight he saw. The man on the forest floor was bucking around as though the devil were in chase. His razor-sharp shashka was drawn and in hand, and, though fear had made him clumsy, it was clear from how he wielded the weapon that he had been trained in its use. Voitenko stood stunned a moment and took in the man's deep blue jacket, golden belt, wide trousers, high jackboots, and red-topped papaka that marked him out as a Zaporozhian Cossack in full military dress. What the devil is going on here? What's all this warring with shadows, man? There's no enemy here, I think. Voitenko scanned the high-rises around them, where the oak stood at the head of the incline. There was nothing up there but wind crackling in the old trees. No enemy? The Cossack stumbled to his feet and stared up the same rise, pointing his shashka into the shadows like a man in delirium. Have you no eyes, man? Look at him there! Voitenko stood closer and strained his eyes as one peering at small print in poor light. I see nothing. Look in the name of heaven! Did God not give you faculties? Look at the Antichrist, there! He pointed the weapon more fiercely than before. Look at him! Why, he's fierce-eyed as any Turk, this one! Look at him! Sliding between the trees, sly as any pollock. He's as real as you or I, I tell you. And with that, Voitenko was sure the young man intended to race up the rise and attack with his sword whatever fairy tale demon stalked up there in the woodlands of his fevered mind. 
and so the monk did what any good Christian would do. He put his hand on the Cossack's jacket and drew his fiery gaze. The weapon in his hand went slightly limp, which Voitenko took as a favorable sign. My son, I believe you're overwearied. It's a fair road from Kanev, wherefrom I know you must have come. And I have a little sausage and some dumplings left over from my evening meal. No on Lenten, fair mind, though enough to give you strength for your journey back to town. And if there is any enemy up there among the trees, you know as well as any good Christian that the Lord protects no place better than a monk's quarters from violence. A new hope of redemption seemed to flash in the young Cossack's eyes, and then he stared again, uphill, at the frightening absences between the oaks. Yes. By God, you're right, Father. He'll never come down here within sight of the hermitage. He pointed his long shashka back towards the cave, like a cavalry commander ordering a retreat. Come then, Holy Father. I'll take a bite of your food, and you can say a prayer for me before I journey on. The monk sat near his maple boards and watched his young visitor slouching near the alcove and polishing off the last of his dumplings. He, like any good Cossack, had lamented the lack of sour cream and that there was only water to wash down his repast. He had mentioned at one point his wish for some distilled wine, but the monk explained that he'd not seen a drop since taking holy orders. Yes, old father. I feel I know you. Aren't you old Voitenko, who comes to town once weekly to beg oil and food? Even what you're eating now was originally from Kanev. The town has been very good to me. Ha! <laughs> good. God curse me, sinner that I am. But I don't think there's a monk or priest in the province who knows what good is, if you'll forgive me. To pitch your steel against another man's and to take his gold. Now that's good. God forgive me, but my best times were on the back of a horse when the damned French and their bastard Pollocks arrived. God's hooks did we give them a run. We'd scatter like wind when they chased us, and pound down like iron if we chased them. They'd drop everything when we hallooed into sight. Weapons, uniforms, valuables of all kinds, and we'd take the lot for spoils. We burned the land all the way back to Moscow, and let them browse about in singed bushes for berries that wouldn't nourish them. Ah, if old Bonaparte had had the Cossacks, he'd be the Emperor of China now. Aye, and the women. At that time, I had a wife in every town and village in Little Russia. Aye, God curse me. My girl and Gadiak had eyes that would turn a patriarch's head. Legs like young cedars and breasts like no poet ever described. Jesus Christ, how I still remember the nights with my girl and Gadyak. Voitenko had been listening to all this, though not in shock. Regardless of what the young Cossack may have believed, the monk was not unfamiliar with the ways of the world. Rather, it was his familiarity itself that had forced him into monasticism. He remembered the arrival of the Grand Army too, though it was a point in his own history which he was more than happy to repress. But that was quite a time ago. Tell me, my son, how do you come to be here now, and still in your military dress? The Cossack looked down as though he had forgotten his own clothes. The fingers of his right hand plucked absent-mindedly at a patch of brocade. Then he looked at the monk. You'll think me a very queer gentleman, but as Jesus is my witness, I can't remember having put these clothes on, neither this morning nor the day before. Last I recall wearing them was in those engagements I spoke about, as we watched what remained of the Grand Army retreating west. There was a lull in discussion. Both sat a moment, each looking at the other, and listening to the strange wind out among the twisted oaks. Voitenko was beginning to think his visitor was the worse for drunkenness, though he spoke in every way like a sober man. Ah, uh, 
that we had some wine, old father. You would not deny me a drinking partner had we wine. You drink my health, and I drink yours, Voitenko. And we'd have some merrymaking to wake this hermitage up, by God. I think you'd find me a, a poor partner in such things. I've been a monk now so long. How long? Uh, I can't remember now. What? As long as that? Do you forget what it was to feel comfort, then? Yeah. I think I may forget now. I've worn a hair shirt so long that my skin has become the hair shirt. Does this life not make you miserable? Yes. I'd be distressed to think there was a dog on a midden in hell so uncomfortable with life as I've become. But, as the fathers used to say, only he who's eaten a lemon appreciates sugar. And so I'm content to think that my sweet time will come when I'm called home to Christ. The monk patted the maple boards by which he sat, the ones which the Cossack had only now noticed, looked to all the world like the old man's casket. The wind changed direction and drove down the incline towards the cavern mouth. Voitenko looked at the young man, who in turn was staring out through the exit at a night so dark all shapes were imperceptible. The monk knew by the terrified glaze in the Cossack's eyes that the young soldier was dreaming again of that weird enemy that had given him chase through the blackness of St. Michael's Wood. Voitenko had allowed the Cossack to remain the night and it must have been the addition of another body, the noise of his breathing or his fidgeting on the stones, that made the monk dream, and dream so strangely. Usually, since taking orders, Voitenko's sleep was dark and imageless, but tonight was different. In his sleep now, he knelt by the lamp-lit alcove and the ebony crucifix. The black Jesus' face was contorted as though straining under the weight of all Voitenko's years of prayer. In the dream, he prayed again, and the words of the prayer were the same. Help us, Lord, to remain safe from all the perils which threaten us in the form of visible and invisible enemies. <coughs> as he sat up on the boards, the white face that leered at him in the darkness was still imposed like a fiery afterimage on his brain, and as he scanned the small room, he saw that the Cossack too had risen and was himself kneeling in the blackness, his shashka pointed down into the stone and his white lips moving in prayer. Dear Virgin, bearer of Christ, protect us from all forces supernatural. What's going on here? Voitenko rose and lit a lamp. He was sure now that it was the Cossack's movements and not those of some dreamed-of demon that had woken him. He blinked to dislodge the memory of the smirking red-lipped ape he'd seen in the entranceway, and as the yellow light spilled into the cave again, he felt more capable of rational thought. Don't you see it? I woke and it was leaning over me. Standing there at the entrance with its thin legs and smiling face. It was holding a woodsman's axe and waiting for me to emerge. What is all this? You dream, is all. And only children continue to be afraid when the dream is over. It was no dream. I saw its white face there. It just stood, grinning. And as I knelt and prayed, its grin grew wider, as though it had no fear of God. Voitenko put a protective hand on the Cossack's jacket. All such things fear God, my son. Not this. When it wouldn't leave, I asked what it was. Are you a devil? I said, and its head shook. Are you a witch? I asked, and its head shook again. Then I began to make out its body in the darkness, and God help me, Voitenko. I knew what it was and how no measure of prayer will save me from it. The monk sat the Cossack down on his boards and told him to rest. 
His fevered talk had become more delirious still, and he had begun to hint at knowledge of a phantasmagoric world unspoken of in any of the traditions of orthodoxy. Instead, God preserved them, his rantings had begun to include references to ancient Slavic folklore, which predated Christianity itself. Voitenko promised that he would personally undertake to chase the spirit from the wood. Now, notwithstanding his vocation and so his intimate knowledge of the supernatural, Voitenko was nevertheless educated and not a superstitious man. He credited the Domovoi, the gnomes, and the vampires of his ancestors, as much as he believed that toads can smell gold or that old women can charm cockroaches. But none of that mattered. Voitenko also knew that what a man believes can kill him as easily as if it were of flesh and blood, and that equally, if the Cossack was orthodox, he would certainly benefit from a little of the monk's good-natured charlatanry. He patted the Cossack's jacket and assured him that whatever invisible enemy stalked him in the woods, its power was like darkness to the light of Christ. He would go now, out into the woods alone, and he would compel the demon off with every holy name and incantation set down in holy scripture. In the end, Voitenko assured the young man he would be permitted unmolested passage back home to Kniv. The Cossack held onto the monk's garment and trembled. Voitenko, I tell you that creature is impervious to prayer. But the monk would not be put off and said a small prayer of protection over the Cossack's forehead before rising and making his own way out into the impenetrable darkness, there to make a show of exorcism and thereby dispel this unaccountable fear from his visitor's mind. What are you doing here? You hear me, man? What are you doing here? The cold wind raced down from the shadowy trees and ruffled in the monk's long robes. And the man with the white face stood as though he were a statue carved from marble, answering none of the questions put to him and staring unwaveringly at the mouth of the cave. I am Yevgeny Voitenko. This is my hermitage. All in Kanev support my claim here, and you, sir, are trespassing. The white face turned and looked at the speaker. Dear Christ, the eyes, too, were pale and colorless. I know you, Yevgeny Voitenko. I am the woodsman. Only then did Voitenko notice the silver axe, dangerously sharp, that hung from one of the man's pallid hands. I have come to cut off his head. Voitenko's eyes widened in horror. There was something terrifying about the slow and measured way the figure spoke, with no hint of violence about such violent things. You will do no such thing. Now, whoever you are, this has gone far enough. If you have a grievance with my young friend, I suggest you seek out a magistrate. But in the name of Christ, I compel you off this land. The specter twisted its head and smiled with those red, apish lips. The man was beginning to look entirely inhuman in Voitenko's eyes. This land does not belong to Christ. I was here on the Dnieper before he came. I will be here on the Dnieper after he goes. Voitenko couldn't help but shiver at the visitor's unearthly voice. That, and there were faint, wispy shapes tucked in behind his back, like the fold of massive wings. Now, send out that bloody crow that I might cut off his head. The worst is I, I, 
think I know that face. The Cossack, to whom Voitenko had explained their predicament, was ignoring the older man. He sat on the maple boards, leaning his head back against the rock, his eyes closed in terror and regret. I would have her back in Gadiak, Voitenko. I had a girl there, you know. Uh, her eyes. Uh, her arms. His face. Have I seen it before? Have I dreamed it before tonight? She was my lamb. We never spoke of warring, and oh God curse me. I never remember sleeping an hour when she was near. Yes. I saw him first when I first saw St. Michael's Wood. He was standing in the clearing as he is now. He watched a crow light on a branch. He heard it caw and then was gone. I, I remember too first seeing this wood. The serfs had captured a parcel of Polacks on the Napier. I dare say they had wives of their own. But how bloody their scythes and knives were, the serfs. I and my Shashka too, after we'd removed their manhoods and hung their bodies in the oak trees. Voitenko looked at the Cossack without a trace of shock. There were tears in the young man's eyes, and Voitenko knew, in that moment, all he wanted was another chance to live, to forget those days and all the brutality the body is capable of, to ride back to Gadyek and meet a girl there from whom he'd been too long parted. As he thought this, the monk looked at the coffin-shaped maple boards, and a tiredness flickered in his chest like the wings of a great moth. Here was a strange affair, he thought, a young man facing death who'd rather live, and an old man facing life who'd rather die. He glanced at the cave mouth. The demon, the woodsman, he knew without having to know, was still standing in the clearing with his axe sharp and ready to avenge the Polacks mutilated and murdered while fleeing west with the Grand Army. Their blood fed to earth that was holy in some religion other than any orthodoxy. Suddenly, it was painfully clear to Voitenko what he must do. He turned to face the young Cossack. I will take your place. What do you mean? You still wish to live. But I've been longing to die for quite some time now. So long that I forgot how long. I'll put on your jacket and belt, your trousers and jackboots, and I'll wear your papaka on my head. You can wear my robe and hair shirt and put on my sufia. Then I'll go into the woods a second time and let the woodsman, devil take him, sever my neck with his axe. Maybe then he'll give us both the peace we've been searching for. Will it work? I believe it worked before. Christ, I can see the crow on the branches. Come, let's try. At the monk's insistence, the young Cossack rose and stripped down to his undergarments. The monk stripped down the same. In the end, they traded the piles of their clothes. The monk dressed as the Cossack, and the Cossack tugged on the monk's attire. The young man scratched his neck as though his skin were on fire. God curse me, but this shirt is harsh. It feels like I've worn it for years already. The body becomes accustomed to it. Voitenko took the razor-sharp shashka in his hand, and some mystic pulse of memory ran up his arm, through his veins, and into the center of him. Do you know how to use that? I've been trained in its use. Voitenko sidestepped into the ring of shadows cast by the ancient oaks. The woodsman smiled. Welcome, Yevgeny Voitenko. I have come to cut off your head. Every time you fight, Yevgeny Voitenko, but every time you lose. <laughs> A crow had settled again on a nearby branch, from which the ghost of a dead soldier hung. Just as every branch that ringed the clearing 
was strung, too, with the gory, staring, and castrated bodies of dead men, suspended there like lines of ribbon at a carnival. The woodsman's white face grew stern and frighteningly alien. There is no mistaking it now as a creature not of this earth, and its crowish wings ruffled like a living cape down its frilly spine. Voitenko nodded before answering. You came to kill a Cossack, not a monk. Then, as though to confuse the enemy, Voitenko sidestepped three times before running headlong and slashing the air keenly with the shashka. The steel whistled in the air, but the woodsman dodged and battered all its massive weight against the attacker. The wind was beaten from Voitenko's lungs as he landed in the leaf litter. He heard the creature approach on its hornish feet and dashed back to a kneeling position. He cut the air with his blade again, but this time the woodsman displayed the full extent of his supernatural abilities. The giant grabbed at the speeding blade and held the razor metal in his palm like a yew branch. Its skin did not so much as blemish when the steel made contact. Voitenko is now inches from the thing's waxy face. He saw its eyes freckled white like tree lines in the snow. He saw its red lips glisten like the blood of the war dead. And in the gray veins that threaded through its facial skin, tiny pulses of black fluid ran like boats negotiating the flow of the Akaron. The woodsman raised his massive arm. In just a moment before dying, Voitenko saw the axe blade silhouetted harshly against the slowly lightening sky. In a wood on the banks of the Dnieper, known to the people of Kniv by the name of St. Michael, a monk who was once a Cossack tends to the affairs of the former while having forgotten almost entirely his earlier vocation. There is some confusion concerning his identity, but when he comes to town to beg whale oil, dumplings, and a little meat, he is generally referred to as Yevgeny Voitenko, who had lived in the cave in the forest since before anyone's grandfather's time. He must be exceedingly old by now, think the young people. Indeed, his bent body and wrinkled face say nothing about his past power with the sword, how he raced ahead of the Grand Army for miles in the days of Napoleon, and how, as no one now remembers, among all his conquests with the women of Little Russia, there was a girl once in Gadyak, whose eyes and arms he loved. Now he longs only for death, and he keeps the maple boards still as a small memento of his mortality. He wears a hair shirt and puts down no bedclothes when he sleeps, and every night he prays the same prayer. The prayer for enemies, which protects against the invisible things he still catches sight of now and then among the glades. And in a long progression of nights, in forgetfulness deeper than a river's bed, he waits. He waits for a small disturbance outside in the leafy litter of the forest. He waits to emerge again, expecting a drunk from Kanev only to encounter a young Cossack thrashing on the ground, swiping his practice blade at something only he can see. That's too bad. Voitenko and the Cossack were just getting to be good friends before the woodsman had an axe to grind. Uh-oh. Looks like the guest finally figured out what music drives phantoms out. Gotta go. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale. Until the next one, won't you stay the night?